Uh, my, my name is Trevor Lunn. I'm a member of the um, Assembly and Executive Review Committee. A fairly new member, I may say, but I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's seminar. The theme of the session is Governance and Assembly Review, and you'll be looking at two diverse but very timely subjects, Petitions of Concern and Women in, in Politics. To deal with Petitions of Concern first, the first part looks at this. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept. Is there anybody here who isn't familiar with the concept of a Petition of Concern? I'll tell you anyway. It's, uh, it's a mechanism by which any vote or decision of the Assembly may be subjected to the requirements of cross-community consent. It's triggered by the signature of at least 30 members. And basically what it means is that um, if a petition is triggered, 50% of unionists present and 50% of nationalists present have to support the proposal for it to go through. I can I'll let you imagine how a member of the Alliance Party thinks about that because we are neither unionist nor nationalist. The origins of petitions of concern go back to the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, and they were then subsequently given effect by the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and by the standing orders of the Assembly. Now, valid petitions have been tabled in the Assembly over 50 times now since 1998, with a fairly even split in their use between unionists and nationalists. It should also be noted on occasions a series of petitions have been tabled on amendments to the same bill. For example, the Caravans Bill in 2011, the Justice Bill in the same year, and the Criminal Justice Bill in 2013. Uh, we, we had four last night, I believe, in terms of the Local Government Bill. Um, so that number has gone up substantially. There, there are differing, differing opinions concerning the use of this mechanism. Some see it as an essential safeguard protecting the rights of the two main communities, while others view it as a tool that is perhaps too easily wielded to block progress. The Assembly and Executive Review Committee is currently conducting a review into the use of petitions. The committee was able to draw on evidence provided by expert witnesses as part of our previous review into the hunt, community designation and provisions for opposition. The committee's debate has included the following issues, the, the frequency of their use, potential limitations on their use, and alternative mechanisms to ensure cross-community support. All of the parties on the committee have had the opportunity to put forward their views, and the committee will be publishing its report in the near future. Uh, Dr. Alex Swartz from Queen's University has examined the mechanism, and his presentation will address some of the issues examined by the committee, offering in particular, I hope, an interesting perspective on how mutual vetoes operate in other divided societies. The, the second topic today, then, is women in politics, and it's one that's always in the forefront of political discussion, and more specifically, the underrepresentation of women in political life. With, with the exception of Doyle Aaron, the Assembly has the lowest level of female representation for devolved and national legislators in these islands. And to put that in a wider European context, we have the lowest representation of comparable devolved institutions in Western Europe, with the exception of Italian regional legislatures. On Monday of last week, the Assembly actually debated this issue. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that all parties recognize that there is a problem and resolve to support measures to increase female representation but the challenge for us now is to translate those words into action. The Assembly and Executive Review Committee has taken an interest in the, and has received a briefing on this, this subject from the Assembly Research and Information Service. So today's presentation from Professor Yvonne Gallican from Queen's University looks at the barriers faced by women who want to pursue a political career, including the cultures and work practices of legislatures. However, Professor Gallican will also identify a number of practical initiatives that have been implemented elsewhere aimed at increasing the number of women in political life. And these include examples from the Republic of Ireland, the Lebanon and the Czech Republic. So there are concrete examples and success stories that the Assembly can draw on as it looks to address this issue. I might, I might just say as an aside that this was something that we looked at within the party about 15 years ago. And, uh, the party decided to adopt a positive discrimination in terms of uh, selection of candidates in favour of women. 
until our women got to hear about it. And then they said, no, we're not having this. It's either merit or not at all. So we still choose entirely on merit. And there I said, it's actually worked quite well. I'm not, I'm not bore you with the figures, but we have a very good representation at council level of, of female members. So I'd like again to welcome our speakers. We're looking forward to your presentations and I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion afterwards. So I hope you enjoy your day. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here to participate in the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series. I think this is really <clears throat> an excellent initiative. Uh, and I should say at the outset that I take this notion of exchange quite literally in the sense of a two-way stream of communication between academia and the assembly. Though my topic here today, petitions of concern, is one which I've learned a great deal about through reading research produced by the assembly itself, particularly work by Ray McCaffrey, who's with us here today. So I hope to give something back here, uh, hopefully something which might be of use to the assembly's ongoing deliberations about the petition of concern procedure and how it might be reformed to work better and perhaps be a little less dysfunctional. So there are basically two parts to what I want to talk about here today. Mm -hmm. The first being the problems or criticisms associated with the petition of concern as it presently works and to evaluate some of the strengths uh, of those criticisms. And then options for reform really informed by the experience of other deeply divided places and how they uh, have managed uh, similar sorts of procedures. So first off, it's important to note the theory behind the petition of concern. It is effectively a veto procedure. Northern Ireland's system of government is a fairly clear example of what political scientists call consociational democracy a form of democratic government sometimes observed in and often prescribed for deeply divided places. Broadly speaking, the idea behind consociationalism is to ensure that power is shared between all or most politically salient societal segments, leaving none at risk of being dominated by any of the others. And consistent with that consociational model, Northern Ireland's system of government includes proportional representation in the assembly, and inclusive cross-community power sharing in the executive. Also consistent with consociational theory, these elements are complemented by a veto scheme, providing additional safeguards against the possibility that one segment might politically dominate the other. There are actually two kinds of vetoes here. There is what you might call the key decisions veto, so certain so-called key decisions, amendments to standing orders, budget allocations, the election of the presiding officer, are automatically subjected to the requirements of the cross-community consent decision rules. And then there is the petition of concern veto, whereby any decision of the assembly may be subjected to the cross-community consent rules, regardless of its subject matter. The two vetoes share a number of things in common. They are both what you might call limited user vetoes in the sense that they single out two groups in particular, in this case designated unionists and designated nationalists, and empower them, arguably at the expense of designated others. Both vetoes are true vetoes in the sense that they have hard effects, so they don't operate simply just to delay a decision. They can effectively kill a decision in its tracks. But the uh, petition of concern veto is distinguished by its undefined or open-ended scope. So it can, in theory, be activated uh, for any decision regardless of the subject matter. Now, each of these features generates its own line of criticism or its own set of potential problems. The limited user aspect invites the argument that the veto is unfair to those who do not identify with either of the jurisdiction's two main communities. The hard effects of the veto create the potential for an unduly negative impact on the assembly's productivity. And the undefined scope or open-ended nature of the petition of concern veto create, creates the potential for abuse. That is, that the veto will be used uh, inappropriately or frivolously. So today I would like to focus on really the latter two criticisms. The argument from unfairness uh, has been dealt with at length uh, elsewhere. So what, what is the evidence then with respect to the impact of the petition of concern on the productivity of the assembly. Well, the petition of concern has frequently been used to block what might be called expressive motions in the assembly or measures which have a merely symbolic importance. 
And however these matters are decided by majority vote or by cross-community consent, they make no real practical difference apart from maybe eating up the Assembly's time. More troubling is the use of the petition concern to block legislative progress. And I can say, fortunately, this sort of thing has been less frequent than one might expect. So according to research conducted last year by Ray McCaffrey, the petition of concern had, as of March 2013, been used 24 times with respect to legislative bills. But as McCaffrey points out, that raw figure actually gives a false impression, because often a separate petition is tabled in relation to a number of specific amendments or clauses in the same bill. So after discounting for those kinds of instances, there are actually only eight, according to my account, only eight distinct pieces of legislation affected by a petition of concern during that period. So the impact on legislative output is not quite so bad as one might expect. What about the frequency of use? <clears throat> well, there is, I think, definitely a subjective impression that the petition of concern is being used with increasing frequency in recent years. And it's certainly true that during the first three years of post-agreement devolution, the petition of concern was used more sparingly. It's also true that recent years suggest a worrying trend of increasing use. Since the Assembly's powers were restored in 2007 up to March 2013, there were 49 uses of the procedure with particularly dramatic spikes in the 2010-2011 uh, session and again in the 2012-2013 session. But if one discounts again for multiple uses of the procedure relating to the same bill, the overall uses between 20, 2007 and March 2013 drops down to 32, which if you do the calculation yields an average use of 0 0.07 petitions per plenary. And this is only a slight increase from the average use of 0 0.04 petitions per plenary during the first three years of the post-agreement period. So while there is some indication of a worrying trend towards more frequent use, the rise in frequency is actually quite minimal, at least so far, despite the, the subjective impression that the petition of concern is being used ever more frequently. Um, it should also be noted that the Assembly's legislative output compares rather favorably with its counterpart in Scotland. So the Northern Ireland Assembly has successfully enacted 86 pieces of legislation, by my count, since its powers were restored in 2007. And over the same period of time, the Scottish Parliament, which enjoys a wider range of competencies than the Northern Ireland Assembly and has no equivalent to the petition of concern veto, has enacted only 15 more pieces of legislation. So I think that's, that's good news. The more pressing problem, I think, is this potential for abuse. Because of its undefined scope, there is nothing to prevent the petition of concern from being employed increasingly to obstruct the normal work, the kind of bread and butter politics work of the assembly in the future. Now, in order to define this question of abuse, we need to kind of step back and think about what a proper use of the veto would be. The underlying purpose of a veto power in a consociational system, such as the one we have here in Northern Ireland, is to protect distinctive group interests. So in the case of Northern Ireland, these are the distinctive, you might say, ethno-national interests of the two main communities. And as I see it, there are basically three categories of decisions that would touch on those interests. So these would be, in the first place, decisions relating to um, lang language, culture, identity, symbols, and so on, that have an obvious kind of ethno-national resonance, decisions about what flags to fly from Northern Ireland's government buildings, for example, or decisions related to the promotion or legal recognition of the Irish and Ulster Scots languages would also fall into this category. Second, you would have decisions that relate to the legacy of the conflict. So this category would include decisions relating to victims and survivors, the commemoration of members of the security forces or perhaps paramilitary organizations, and truth recovery for conflict-related deaths, to name a few examples. Third category here would be decisions which relate to the constitutional structure and institutional setup under the terms of the Belfast Agreement itself. So this category would include decisions relating to the cross-border institutions, for example, or decisions relating to the assembly. In all such matters, I think it's fair to say that unionists and nationalists will predictably have very different preferences which are informed by their distinctive ethno-national perspectives. And the veto procedure ensures that neither group will be able to impose those preferences on the other by simple strength of numbers. But because the scope of the petition of concern veto is open-ended, 
It is capable of being used to block decisions which have nothing to do with these community-specific interests. In the words that Mark Durkin recently put it, it's capable of being played like a joker to trump a decision that someone simply just would rather not uh, see passed. And indeed, um, nationalists, unionists, and even the others have all been guilty, so everyone, everyone is, is a party to this, of tabling what might be called pseudo-petitions of concern on occasion. There are numerous matters, same-sex marriage, a woman's right to choose, caravans bill, planning, dual mandates of MLAs, which do not have, I think it's fair to say, an inherent unionist or nationalist aspect, but where petitions of concern have nevertheless been employed to constrain the assembly's decision making. And these are what I would call abuses of the procedure. I don't mean to use, use the word abuse. I don't mean to you know, suggest any kind of moral condemnation in that. It's just a, a matter of the procedure being used for the types of uh, issues it, for which it was not really intended or not intended in, according to the logic of a consociational democracy. So what can be done about this? What might be done to ameliorate the problem and curb the potential uh, for abuse of the procedure? And I hear, here I think we can look productively to the experience of other consociational democracies for some ideas or some lessons. And I would offer two possible remedies here, but each of these, I should say, comes with its own caveats. One way to curb the potential for abuse of the petition of concern is to restrict its use to certain specified subject matters. So it would be actually sort of making it a little bit more like the key decision veto in that sense. Uh, examples of this approach can be found in contemporary Macedonia, as well as in Cyprus's experience with consociational democracy between 1960 and 1963. So, for example, under the Constitution of the Republic of Macedonia, certain subject areas are singled out. Legislative bills that directly affect culture, use of language, education, the use of symbols, as well as laws on local finances, the boundaries of municipalities, uh, must be passed by concurrent or parallel majorities overall, as well as majorities of the representatives of the country's various minority groups. Now, there are at least, I think, two potential problems with this kind of remedy uh, with defining the scope of the veto in this way. Uh, first of all, some potential for abuse, I think, inevitably remains in the form of, of veto bargaining. So as Cyprus's brief experience with consociationalism illustrates, restricting communal vetoes to predefined matters does not necessarily remove the potential for destabilizing abuse. A group can still use a veto it has in one subject area to barter over subject areas in which it does not enjoy a veto. So that's something to watch out for. Um, a second problem, and I think this is particularly a problem here, is that it's, I think, very difficult to define communal interests or the vital communal interests uh, of the communities in advance. So in the, in the context of Northern Ireland, the boundary between normal bread and butter politics and these kind of mega constitutional issues with ethno-national significance is, is quite nebulous. So it's difficult to anticipate what sorts of issues will be injected with that kind of significance in advance, and that would be another pitfall or caveat about this kind of uh, solution to the problem. So far, I think the open-ended scope of the petition of concern has managed to catch issues of this kind as they arise, matters which otherwise might have been excluded by an exhaustive list of specified community interests. An alternative then to trying to delineate exhaustively the subject matter for a petition of concern is to leave the scope of the veto undefined but make its use subject to some kind of review mechanism according to some set of principles or criteria. The question then is how to define the criteria for reviewing the use of the veto. One idea is to tie the use of the veto, the petition of concern veto, to human rights and equality matters. So the petition of concern would be used to vet decisions for conformity with equality and human rights norms, say the European Convention on Human Rights, or if there ever was one, a possible Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And presumably the veto would be used less frequently then <clears throat> if it only applied where human rights and equality norms were at issue. But the difficulty I see with this proposal is that depending on how it is implemented, human rights and equality criteria may either be too limiting if interpreted strictly or too vague if they're interpreted broadly. So if the criteria are interpreted strictly, for example, to mean that a petition of concern can only block a decision that is suspect from the perspective of the European Convention on Human Rights, then virtually I think none of the petitions we've seen so far would have succeeded in blocking anything. If on the other hand, the criteria are interpreted broadly, 
say, for example, to include the statutory duty under the Northern Ireland Act, uh, Section 75, to promote quality of opportunity, then virtually any decision of the Assembly might be subjected to a petition of concern. That's at least so long as the jurisprudence on Section 75 remains, to put this sort of politely kind of vague. Um, so there are, there are definitely problems with either of those scenarios. In the first scenario, the proposed reform significantly weakens the petition of concern as a tool for protecting distinctive group interests. In the second scenario, the reform would do little to curb the potential for abuse. So another approach, which I think would be more in keeping with the theory of consociational democracy, would be to try to articulate a list of the general categories or matters that are of particular interest to the two main communities that would serve as a guide for review. So not an exhaustive list, but a sort of list of categories and analogous categories. The body responsible for the review would then consider whether an attempted petition of concern falls under one of the listed types or alternatively relates to an analogous matter. And the broad categories referred to earlier would be a good place to start here in defining this, this, these kind of criteria. So matters relating to symbols, cultural identity, matters relating to the legacy of the conflict, matters relating to the institutions set up under the terms of the Belfast Agreement. In fact, the agreement itself could be a useful interpretive guide here for this kind of process of review. So a proposed decision that apparently ran counter to some of the expressed principles in the agreement would be prima facie a legitimate target for a petition of concern. But whatever the criteria that we would uh, decide on, this option entails some mechanism for review. So some body or some individual will be entrusted with the responsibility of deciding whether a proposed use of the veto is in fact a valid use by the light of the criteria in question. And here the choice in terms of the mechanism for review is broadly speaking between a judicialized mechanism or an internal political mechanism. And Bosnia-Herzegovina's consociational system uh, includes an example of the first kind. So pursuant to the constitution there set up after the Dayton Agreement, a proposed decision of the Parliamentary Assembly may be declared to be destructive of what they call a vital interest of one of the three constituent peoples there, so Bosniaks, Croats, or Serbs, by a majority of the designated members of any of those three groups within the House of Peoples, which is one of the two national legislative chambers. The use of the vital interest veto, as it's called, can then be challenged, in which case the veto is referred to a cross-community joint commission. If the commission then fails to come to a consensus decision within five days, the matter is then referred to the constitutional court, which shall, in an expedited process, review the attempted veto for procedural regularity. But in practice, procedural regularity review means that the court actually determines if a vital interest is in fact at issue in the decision and whether or not that interest is actually threatened or not by the decision in question. So in the absence of an exhaustive list of vital interest matters, the Constitutional Court in Bosnia has had to approach this question of what constitutes a vital interest on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's developed a kind of factor-based approach for assessing whether a matter does in fact impinge upon a vital community interest or not. As it happens, the vital interest veto is not used very frequently there, which may be due in part to the fact that it is subject to this kind of review check by the constitutional court. Now, I think if we were to do something like this here, the challenge would be to uh, provide for this kind of review mechanism without making the whole process terribly uh, expensive and time consuming. Uh, and so you might suggest maybe a, a more efficient alternative would be to the regular courts, uh, would be to set up some kind of special statutory tribunal to decide such matters on an expedited basis. But regardless of how the review mechanism would be designed, I think there are several potential pitfalls with this sort of judicializing of the veto process. So although it might ultimately prevent certain kinds of abuses, it certainly opens the procedure up to an additional kind of abuse, which is that people may engage the procedure simply for strategic reasons to delay a matter. Depending on how it was designed, the delays could be quite severe. And even if the assembly were to opt for a special tribunal to hear these questions, the decisions of that tribunal would, in all likelihood, be subject to judicial review in the ordinary courts, thereby expanding the potential for further delay and expense. <clears throat> 
Finally, one might also worry about the politicizing effect that this procedure might have on the judiciary. So arguably, if the judges were being called on to intervene in the workings of the assembly in this way, then the composition and the politics of the court would become a matter of greater political contestation, and that you know, arguably isn't, isn't a good thing. Certainly, I, I don't think that uh, our judiciary here would welcome this kind of responsibility. They, I think they would, they would uh, prefer not to have it. Um, so, in light of these concerns, the assembly could opt for a political review mechanism. The simplest mechanism of this kind would rely on the presiding officer to vet petitions of concern so he or she would be empowered to reject a petition of concern where it appears that the procedure is being abused to block a matter that fails to satisfy the relevant criteria, however they would be defined. A key advantage of this option is that there's already a precedent for this kind of review within the assembly. So pursuant to the terms of the St. Andrews Agreement, 30 members of the assembly may ask for a ministerial decision to be referred to the executive committee on the grounds that the decision may have contravened the ministerial code or if it relates to a matter of public importance. But before the matter is sent to the executive committee, the presiding officer must first certify that the decision in question does in fact relate to a matter of public importance. So the presiding officer is being trusted here to exercise some judgment about that. The very same sort of mechanism could be instituted as a check against frivolous or inappropriate uses of the petition of concern veto. So to assist the presiding officer, guiding criteria of the sort I described earlier could be agreed to on a cross-community basis. This proposal, of course, does rely on some presumable measure of trust that the, uh, that the parties here currently have in the impartiality of the presiding officer, although one might legitimately worry uh, that giving the presiding officer this kind of responsibility might jeopardize that trust going forward. So in, in conclusion, I think there are in, important trade-offs involved in any veto mechanism, and there are certainly, I wouldn't say that there's any generic one-size-fits-all design that's appropriate for the circumstances of all divided societies. In this case, I think the addition of a political mechanism for reviewing the petition of concern, relying on the putative impartiality of the presiding officer, is arguably the simplest and most efficient remedy for curbing the potential of abuse. It is also, I think, a remedy which might plausibly win cross-community support, since unionists and nationalists have previously agreed on a very similar mechanism to curb frivolous challenges um, to executive decision-making. Uh, that being said, as I suggested earlier, there isn't a perfect fix. And so there's also a plausible argument here that <clears throat> it might be better to leave well enough alone on the grounds that the defects of the existing procedure are not sufficiently serious to warrant uh, this kind of tinkering around. I think ultimately this is a question that the assembly itself is, is best situated to, to answer. And hopefully uh, this paper here has provided some helpful guidance, although probably more caveats uh, than uh, suggestions about the pros and cons involved in some of the possible options for reforming the petition of concern. Thank you.